Hello everyone, <clears throat> and welcome back to the third day of the Revit Primer. Uh, today we're going to focus on um, some visualization stuff, setting up sheets, setting up views, editing visibility, annotations, all that stuff. So I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'm going to open up the old Barcelona Pavilion model that we built last time. Yours should be a little bit more completed than this, but um, you know I'll just work within this. To show you a couple things of, uh, you know, again, like how to dimension, how to set up sheets, how to set up views and things like that. So in Revit, the way to really work in terms of annotation is to work directly in the view itself. <clears throat> so unlike some other programs like maybe AutoCAD, where you would sometimes put a view on a different XREF or a different sheet and annotate it, that's not really the way you work in Revit. In Revit, you work directly in the view, and the scale of the elements will change depending on what the view itself is set for. So what that means is if, just to kind of show you an example, if I go into my floor plan here, and I wanted to dimension this, I'll dimension these grid lines by clicking on the dimension up here. Click from there to there. And that's the scale of my dimension. I'm at an eighth inch scale right now, so that seems kind of small, but um, you know, because of the overall size of the plan and everything like that, it uh, it's it's working well. And actually, just for the sake of this, I'm going to take off my view template right now. I'm going to make this none, and if I change the overall scale of this to let's say a quarter inch. you'll see that the dimension actually shrinks relative to that, as do the grid lines. So the dimensions themselves and the annotations themselves scale relative to the, the view. And that's good, because what it means is that if you use this style of dimension, the linear dimension style, 332nd aerial, no matter what sheet this is on and no matter what scale that sheet is at or that view is at, this dimension will always be the same. It'll always print at the same size, and that's really good graphic standards and good drawing set standards. And the same thing goes for the bubbles and the annotations. They will always print at the exact same size. So what this means is you don't really have to think about the scale of the annotations as you're working in the views. Revit will automatically determine what the appropriate scale for them is. So, you know, what you do is you kind of get the view set up with the annotations on it that you want, get it ready to go and then put it on a sheet. You can edit it later on if you want to and then you can work within the sheets themselves, but this is kind of the best practice. You, it, you put the annotations directly within the view itself, not on the sheet. You can add annotations to sheets, certain ones, but again, it's usually best to have them directly in the view. So let's say I'm here in my view, my floor plan. I'm gonna turn off the shadow here and we'll get more into this in a bit, but I'll turn off that shadow and I'm gonna come back and actually apply that view template. So we'll go to the JV arch plan. Um, oh, and I guess shadow is part of that. So, um, you know what, for now, let's, uh, let's go back to none and we'll create a new view template out of this after we get it to the way we like it. So I'll turn off the shadow because I want this to be more of an architectural plan. You remember we filled this in last time on the last demo. So for graphic settings, you can change those. We'll get into that a little bit more today. But uh, let's say I've got this kind of close to how I want it to be. I can start doing things like adding dimensions. So I'm gonna delete this because I wanna show you, you can actually add multiple dimensions at once by clicking, right? Then you set the height of where you want it to be. I'm sorry, let me do that one more time. You actually click across where you want them all to go and then you can set the height so now that I have that dimension string I can set this and this actually operates all together so that's nice I don't have to then edit them individually um, so yeah I mean it's pretty straightforward you click up here on your dimension and then you come through and you come down if you want a dimension to the center of the wall that might be the default, but you can actually hit tab and figure out exactly where you want a dimension to if you don't want a dimension to the center. By hitting tab, 
I can cycle through. So if I want to dimension to the interior of the wall, I hit tab till I get there, and then I'm good to go. There's also other ways to create dimensions by going into annotate. There's aligned, linear, angular, radial, diameter, and so on. You can also do spot elevations, which is helpful, right? So this is the elevation of the top floor. So I can click, and that's my project elevation. But this stair is actually a little bit lower. So I can click and just get an elevation there. So that's helpful because it allows me to quickly add spot elevations without having to do a ton of math whatever surface I'm clicking on, it'll provide that spot elevation. So there's lots of really great tools in here to do that. Um, you know, if I wanted to do a arc length, I could click on or a diameter perhaps. It might not let me click on this door family. But if I had something circular in the project, like a wall, for example, let's just do a circle wall. I can then go into my annotate and I can do things like get the diameter of that to the center and so on. So it's really, really smart in the way that it dimensions things. So you can go through and start adding some critical dimensions. And then once you've got it to a point where you like it, you can come in here and you can start to tweak these. So the first thing is, let's say I actually at this level, eighth of an inch plan, I might not want it to go down to a 32nd of an inch. So one thing I like to do is define what the tolerance of it is. So the 332nd here indicates the height of the the height of the elevation or the, the height of the text. And by clicking on edit type, you can see those, right? So these are all the different things that are the that define the scale of the of the uh, elements within the dimension. So the text size is 332nd. So that's what this is coming to. But it's also the tolerance, right? So right now, the default tolerance is actually going to 32nd of an inch. So I might rename this and call this Arial, and then I might go 1 32nd inch tolerance. So I know clearly that that's what that's doing. So now I have my 132nd inch tolerance, but that's too, that's too much for this. So I want to create a new style, and what I'm going to do is go to Edit Type, Duplicate, and I want this to maybe be a half inch tolerance, let's say at this scale. Maybe you want to do a quarter, but let's do a half inch. So I'm just going to duplicate it, rename it, call it half inch tolerance, and then I'm going to come down here, and for the units format, by default it uses the project settings. I want to uncheck that. And I'm just going to make my nearing to the roundest half inch rather than the roundest quarter inch, or sorry, 32nd, and click OK. And then I click OK, and you notice that it automatically adjusts these, so now they're to the nearest half inch. And in general, if I wanted every dimension in this plan to do that, I could click on them all and change them, but that's pretty tedious. So I'm going to use a trick for Revit where I can find something that I want to edit right click go to select all instances visible in view and you know what I think because this is to mention string oh I know what's going on let's I've changed this already so that's why it doesn't work so let's change it back to that but if I click this and right click and go select all instances visible in view I now have this select as well and I can click here and change this to a half inch right and now I've changed all of the dimensions that are that. So that's a way of quickly editing all the dimensions in a view without having to go through and click on each. I only have a few here, so it wasn't very tedious, but you could imagine if you had hundreds or dozens of dimensions in a view, it would be tough to change them. So that's a good trick to help just switch everything of a single type in Revit. So now that I've started applying it, I might want to stylize these a bit more. Um, but before I do that, I want to show you one other trick, which is, you know, if I want to create another one of these, I can click here and dimension to the property line. And let's say I wanted this to be clear that this was the dimension to the property line. I can actually double click on this 
and I can add a suffix to this or above or below. So I could say 2PL and click OK. And now the dimension there will actually register 2PL. I could also just, if I wanted to, I could put it below. Depends again on what the graphic standard is for that. So now it's 33 and 5, 5 and a half to the property line. You may try to actually replace the text. So you could say 2PL varies if, let's say, it was an angled wall or something. So 2PL varies. And then, you know what? Actually, let me take off this. But the one thing I can't do is I can't actually just override this. So if I wanted to say that was 30 feet, I'm going to get an error. You, you cannot override a dimension and try to make it tricked into, into displaying something different. So that's something that, you know, is kind of a blessing and a curse with Revit. It has to be exact, which is good sometimes, but other times if you're trying to just do something quickly, it can be challenging. Sometimes you can put a period at the end, right? So I could put a period at the end and sort of trick it into thinking this is 30 feet, right? So by putting that little period in, I can do that, but that's kind of bad practice. If I wanted to kind of get the dimension right, I would, you know, obviously want to just <laughs> um, model it property, which is easier said than done. But I can just go to use actual text, use actual value, and I can override this stuff as needed sometimes. Um, okay, so, you know, one other quick thing is, let's say you have a bunch of smaller dimensions in an area. So if I create similar here, let's say I had something like this, for example, that I needed to show, and I don't want this text overlapping with this dimension string, maybe it gets confusing. I can actually click on this and I can pull this out and it'll give me that, which is actually a real nice graphic method of indicating what certain dimensions are without getting them all stacked up. So all you have to do is click on it drag it away. So there's lots of really, really great built-in things for dimensioning that can help you make the drawings clean and legible and so on. Um, some other things is uh, editing the dimensions for maybe some more style. So I can go to edit type here and let me duplicate this. And let's say this is my office. So rather than it saying Arial, I'm going to call it JB. And I might not like Arial. My style for my office might be something different. So for the, my font, I could call it, let's um, offhand, what's one that we use frequently? Proxima Nova, is that in here? Let me see. Proxima Nova might not be in here. You would have to load that font into your standard, but let's just try Roboto. Let's see if that what that looks like. Click OK. So you see it slightly changed. So there's my JB font. So this is my custom font. I can come down here, change that to my JB font. And now I've got Roboto. There's lots of other things you can do, like um, I think you can, you know, you can put the dimension in line rather than above. So, um, you know, the tick marks, there's lots of ways that you can get in here and customize these to be more consistent with your, your desired graphic style. So you can play around with these, um, but you can also, I mean, you can also put alternate units, which is great because let's say, um, you know, here, this building is the Barcelona Pavilion, which is in the metric system. So I might want to show those as well. So I can do that, and then it'll actually report the millimeters below. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty powerful that it can do all, lots of different things. So that's, that's editing dimensions. Um, some other things that are interesting that you can do with dimensions is, is lock things. So for example, see this sink here? The first thing I might do is make sure that this is centered on this wall. 
I can try to do that myself, but I can also use some Revit tricks where I click on that, I click on that, and then I click on that. So right now it's not centered. You know, this is, this is a situation where you might want to pull these dimensions out. And it's not centered on the wall right now. But if I come and see where this little EQ is that pops up, this is the dimension equality. If I check that, it actually will make this equal on the wall. So it'll always stay equal as well. So if I pull this down, that stays consistently where it's supposed to go. So I might want this toilet and this to be equal, equal, constantly. So let me do that on this side where I go from here to the center to there. Drag that, drag it up. I don't have to do this with the dimension cleanup, but it just makes it more legible. And then check that, and you see that the toilet actually moves. So I'll just do a real quick example. This is good for like lighting grids and things like that. But let's just say I had um, this chair that we built last time. Let's say I had a bunch of these that I wanted to have equally spaced along this bench. I don't know why you would do that, but for the sake of this, let's do that. I can actually click here, click on that, then click on the center of each one of these. Pull this out, and then there's that equal. Check that, and it'll actually space them all perfectly equal. So it's really good, really helpful. If I was to change the dimension of this, they would all array and maintain that. Now, once I delete this, it's just letting me know that these are all still constrained to each other. So if I click OK and I try to move it, I might get an error. But I can just remove the constraints and then I should be able to freely move them. The last thing I'll show you with dimensions is the ability to lock a dimension. So I might have a situation where I want this chair to always be a certain dimension from this wall. So I can click So I'm going to hit tab to make sure I get the, that face. Then I'll go to this edge. Let's say we want it to always be 5 feet from there. To first set it for five feet, I'm actually going to click on this, and you'll see that this dimension changes. It was large text, but if I do this, it actually gives me small text. And I can then edit this. So I can set this for five feet. So now it'll pull that in, and it'll set it. I can then click on this, and I can lock it. And if I try to move this, I can't. I can only move it up and down. I can't move it left or right because it's locked and if I get this wall and I move this wall it's going to move that whole chair and it's going to constantly keep it five feet off of the wall so again if there's certain relationships that you want to set up let's say there's a hallway that always needs to be a minimum of five feet for code or something like that you can lock that dimension and it's impossible to change that you'll get a warning if there's something that basically conflicts or there's an issue with the constraints a warning will pop up and that will um, show you that, that there's a constraint that is being broken. And then you can choose to unconstrain it or you can go back and edit it um, as needed. Okay, so so that's, that's um, constraints and dimensions and things like that. And, you know, I've just kind of thrown some quick dimensions on here, but you can go through and do a little bit more accurate. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is tagging. So if I click here on annotate, there's a bunch of different tag situations here. Um, if I want to start just doing, let's say, room tags, for example, I'm going to click here on room tag. And these are the only spaces that I believe I have that are, let me see. Seems to be a problem with those. Let me check something quick. It might 
might have to do with the way that this is constrained. I'm just going to test something out real quick. I'm going to create a wall here. And I can go to room tag. Oh, I'm sorry. I know what's going on. In architecture, I have to go to room here first. So this will actually create the room. I was, I was getting ahead of myself. So even if it's all constrained, it's not a room until you call it a room. So I have to click on room first and then click there and then click here. And now I've got my rooms. And you see, if I try to place a tag out here, it's going to give me that box. And I'm going to get an error message because it's not in a properly enclosed region. So this actually doesn't have a room around it. But these do. So once I've got that, I can actually come in here and rename this. So I can call this sitting room, foyer, whatever these are called. And I've got my, my rooms. I can also add the area to these. So if I click on this, I can edit the type and I can go to show area. And then it'll show the area of the room beneath. And again, I'll show you how to customize annotations in a bit, but this is sort of a default way of doing it. You can also change these, like if this is room A1, because it's in section A of the building, you can do that, or A2, and so on. Um, but that's how you start to create rooms, room tags. If you wanted to do things like tag doors that you have in place, you can go to annotate, and you can do tag by category. So it should identify what it thinks you want to tag. So you can see it's actually changing. This is a room tag. I'm sorry, this is a wall tag symbol. This is a room tag symbol. And so on. But you know, before we do that, I'm going to set up a view so we can work a little bit more carefully on this. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to do an enlarged plan of this. So I'm going to go to view and I'm going to go to call out. And I want to do an enlarged plan of this area. So I'm just going to click and drag to create this. And I'm going to drag this over here to clean that tag up. And let's say this is the area that I want to work with. I can try to tighten this up while I'm here. I can always come back and do it later. But I get that being sort of indicating what the, um, the area of my, my enlarged plan is. And it will create this callout view here. So this is level one callout one. I'm going to rename it and just call it level one enlarged living. We'll call it the living area. So it's enlarged living. Great. Now if I double click on this, it actually takes me into that large enlarged version. This is giving it to me at a half inch as a, is equal to a foot. I'm just going to change this to, I'm sorry, it's a quarter. I'm going to change it to a half. And now I've got my enlarged plan set up in here. I can start to do things and add tags in here that aren't going to make the other drawing as cluttered. So I'll come back to architecture, or I'll come back to annotate, click on tag by category, and I can start tagging doors. I can start tagging furniture if I want to. I don't have any furniture tags loaded, so it's going to ask me if I want to load one now. I'll say no for now. I'll show you how to do that in a second. But again, you can use um, TG to tag, TG to tag. These don't have tags loaded yet. We'll do that in a second. But now I'm starting to do my doors and walls. So we'll do TG, we'll tag these walls and so on. Now I'm getting question marks for these because they don't have values assigned to them. The value that it's looking for is actually the mark value. So if I click on here, there is no mark. So if I add a two there, it will work. The other thing is it's giving me this leader, which I may not want. So if I click on this and I uncheck leader, I can then just place this 
there. I usually don't like the leader unless I need it. So all I do is uncheck leader there. And when I'm actually placing it, so if I hit TG again, and I'm placing it, sorry, TG, I can turn off leader here, and then it'll just place it. It's placing it over where I was, but that's a way to not have to uncheck that leader each time. For walls, I usually like the leader. These wall types don't have, um, they don't have a wall type assigned to them. Might be the mark, let me check. No, it's actually in, if I go into edit type, there is a type mark here. Click OK. So there's a difference between a type mark and a mark, and it all depends on how you want to tag things. So walls, for example, are usually tagged as by type. So every single 3 and 5 eighths inch thick stud wall with 5 eighths inch chip on the outside will all be the same type. If it's a 2 by 6 stud wall with chip on the outside, that'll be a different type. So that's why you control it with a type mark. Doors are usually tagged individually. So even if you have the same style of door in multiple places, they each get their own individual tag. So by default, Revit uses the instance parameter of mark for the door and the type parameter of type mark for the wall. Um, now, we didn't have certain um, annotation styles loaded. I'm going to go into um, insert and then load Autodesk family. And we'll start with just some default Autodesk families. And I'll click on annotations. And if I go into, I think it's probably an architectural, I can look for like a furniture tag. So here's a furniture tag. And then I want a plumbing tag. Plumbing, let me see. So it might not be in architecture. We might have to go back into annotations. Um, It's weird that it doesn't have plumbing tags in here. Let me see. Plumbing fixture tag. I don't know what category it's under, but I'm going to grab that too. So I'm going to load this in, and I've got my plumbing fixture tag now. So if I hit TG, I should be able to tag this. Now again, this is empty because I don't have I don't have uh, a type mark associated with it. So if I come here and call this like P1, hit apply, now it'll show up. So it's really, really great to help tag things by embedding information into the uh, family itself. So you don't have to keep track of different annotations and things like that. You just have to keep it all consistent with the, um, with the, the families, with the geometry. So the information gets embedded in the geometry and then gets displayed in the tag, which is, is really, really helpful. Um, so the last thing here is, and I'm going to test this out. This is a generic model, but I want it to be a plumbing fixture. So that's something that the, the, the manufacturer of the family sort of decided this when they built it. This we downloaded off the internet, and it's not going to work, right? So if I try to tag this now, I can't, right? It's, call, it's saying it's a generic model. It's actually a plumbing fixture. I want it to be a plumbing fixture. So that's one of the things that's dangerous about Revit in general and how it kind of categorizes things, right? It has to be the right family type or else certain functionality is not going to happen. So if you ever encounter that, sometimes what you can do is you can go into edit the family, right? I'm in the Duravit here and 
I can go into my properties here, which is family category and properties, which is this folder icon. I'm going to change this to a plumbing fixture. Click OK. And then I'm going to load this back into the project and close it. I can save it if I want to. I won't do that today. But I can load this in. And I'm going to overwrite the existing version. Yes. So this should, in theory, change this to a plumbing fixture. So if I click on this now, it's a plumbing fixture. So if I want to tag this, I can tag this as a plumbing fixture. And I can come into my type mark. And I can make it a um, type mark is here, P2. So now that's my plumbing fixture number two. Okay, so so that's really it. Basic tagging. Um, you may want to customize these a little bit. If you wanted to do that, you can click on this, go to Edit Family, and you may want to change the font. So this right now is a tag label standard, and the reason it's a label is because it's going to pull information in from elsewhere. So I can go to the label. Or I'm sorry, I can click on the tag label, edit the type, and I can change this to that Roboto font, if that's what my office standard is. Click OK, you see it changes it, load into project and close. I'm not going to save it, but you know, in an ideal world, you would have these saved on your server somewhere as your office standard. You would also have them preloaded into your Revit template, so somebody doesn't have Arial tags, they only have Roboto tags. I won't save this, but I'm going to do that. Override the existing version, and I'm not going to save it right now, but now I've got my, my Roboto style tags, which you can see that the text is slightly different from this one, which is my Arial tag. So you would have to do that for all the different types. And again, you would set up your, your, your systems and your different things. You may not use a rectangle like this for plumbing fixtures. You may use a different symbol type. You would have to create that custom. The last thing I'm going to show you is, let's say we don't have these tagged. You can actually come in to annotate and you can do tag all. And if I come and go to um, plumbing fixtures, which actually, yes, here's plumbing fixture tag. I'm going to click there and click OK. It'll actually tag everything in the view that's not tagged. So that's a really good way to just quickly tag everything. You might have to go and clean it all up, but it's, it's great. So, you know, if I didn't have my doors tagged, for example, I can go to architecture. Um, I'm sorry, annotate, tag all, and go to door tags. Click OK. And then I've got those all good to go. All right. So that's basic tagging. The next thing I'll show you is noting. So this again is pretty straightforward, but you would use, you can either use this A up here or you can use it here. Again, this is in the shortcut, so maybe I want to use this. You can see there's a lot of annotation shortcuts up in here, like tagging, dimension, and so on. So I go to text, and by default, it's this no leader text. So I just click, and then I can start typing. And I can say, you know, C overall plan for room dimensions, or something like that. Let's say see overall plan for grid dimensions. And then we might actually dimension in here for our rooms. And I might want a 32nd inch tolerance here because let's say these are more precise. So now I can start to add those, those more precise dimensions. I can also tag the rooms in here. I would not go to architecture and go to room because I already have a room here. 
you see how it shows that blue box I would actually just go into tag room and I can do that here so there's my text but I may want to call the first thing is this is pretty big right so it's 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 defaulting to this quarter inch aerial I could make this bold if I wanted to by just clicking on the text and selecting it but I might want to have more specific notes that are um, standard dimension size so I'm gonna go back into my text I'm gonna come down to the 332nd and I can do lots of different leader styles I usually prefer the two segments so what I can do is start to note this up and I can say install custom curtain wall panel door so that's how I could start to add these custom notes one thing you may run into is right now this is showing up within the view there's this um, annotation crop which sometimes will cause things to not show up especially if they're beyond you see this border so you may note something up let me let me do that again and show you if I was to come here and say text and then I'll put it down here it's gonna disappear right and that can be frustrating, especially if you don't know why. This boundary here is the extents of what the annotations that are gonna show up are. So I can either pull this down to get that to show up, or I can turn off annotation crop in my view, which is here. Cool. So now I've got my um, region. Now this crop region will show up in the view and I can edit it. You may not want this to show up, which I would turn off crop region visible, and it won't show up anymore, but then you can't edit it. I like to keep it on, and you can have them not print, so they're good for reference and for controlling things, but if you don't want them to mess up your, your super clean prints, you can, you can do that. You can show them as not printing. I'll show you that later. I mean, that's how you edit text and add leaders. Pretty straightforward. You can customize the alignment and things like that as needed. Um, you know, what this does is it shows you it coming off the top left if it's coming off the left and off the bottom right if it's coming at the bottom right. That's kind of the um, standard practice. You can change that if you like, but the reason that it defaults to this is because this is what standards typically are. So if I wanted to do this over here, for example, take this shrink this note down and you see it'll always kind of go to the lower right hand corner when it's on this side and the upper left hand corner when it's on this side it's best practice and it's good that the um, software just does that for you automatically so it has a lot of really good built-in capabilities which just kind of help you get it get it good um, okay so so let's say that we're, we're pretty happy with the way this is looking. We can then start to edit things that are more global settings. So let's say the furniture is too pronounced right now, or the line is too dark. I can come in and I can change that in my view template here, but that might be a global standard for how I manage things across all my projects. And if that's the case, I would like to do that in object styles. So I'm going to go into manage. So jumping back in. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Got got distracted. Um, so so yeah, so we've got this view all set up. Um, if we want to change the furniture settings, we can do that using object styles. 
So I can come up here and this globally controls all of the furniture in the entire project. It's not by view. So one of the things you'll notice about Revit is that there's lots of sort of hierarchy of what controls different things. So for example, I could change in here the furniture settings and I could make the line weight thicker. And I can hit apply and hit OK. And this is thicker. It's probably hard to see because I was further away at first. Let me let me go back and change this back to what it was. See how it's smaller? If I come here and I change the overall thickness of the furniture to three and hit apply, it'll do that. I could also do that using um, I could also, you know, control the color of the furniture, for example. Like if I wanted the furniture to be red, I can do that. So all my furniture will show up as red. So I could do that here, right? So let me say, let's say I control it globally there. Now I can override it in the view by going into my view template here and going to furniture. And then I'm going to override it by saying, actually, I want my lines to be blue or magenta click OK and then OK and then apply so now in this view they're magenta if I go back to level one they're red because that's what the object style is globally and if I go into my enlarge plan the view itself here is showing them as magenta so that's how you can sort of globally control things so if I if I wanted my walls for example to be you know thicker line on the outside. My cut line, I wanted it to be heavier, like an eight. I could do that here. Click OK. It'll globally scale them all up. But again, I can then go in to the template itself and override it in that specific view. So that's how you can start to develop your own graphic style that's independent of uh, what um, what uh, Revit gives you. So I have an override on the weight here, so I'm going to click no override and click OK. That's the big heavy eight before it didn't change. So that's, you know, that's too big. So I can go into object styles and I can go to walls. Make this back to like five where it was before. Click OK. So now it does that. So that's, again, that's how you can kind of develop your own graphic style and start to make diagrams and things like that by either overriding things directly in the, um, the view itself or the over overriding the object styles for the project. Okay, so one other thing I'm gonna show you as it relates to 2D views is view filters. View filters are really helpful because what they'll do is they'll allow you to sort of identify certain things. And in order to do this, I'm just gonna, you know, copy this over a couple times because I want to show you some different doors and I'm going to create a similar version of this door here and do it this way and again this might be something I would do in a working view I probably wouldn't do it in a, uh, a main view so let me go back to my working ground I'm sorry, level one. So here's my working view. And I have my CAD underlay in here. So I might actually duplicate this. And I'm going to call this. I'm going to rename this. And I'm going to call this fire rating check. Because what I might want to use this for is checking to make sure the fire ratings on doors are assigned properly. So if I click on this door here and go into edit type, I'm going to rename this and call this 42 by 84 rated. And then I'm going to change the fire rating on this to be one hour. So let's just make it a one. Click OK. And then these, I actually want these, let's say, to be non-rated. So I'm going to duplicate this, 
I could have done this in, in the universe, but I'm just going to call this 42 by 48 non rated. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to remove that fire rating, which was um, this one should be a zero or you know what? Let's just leave it empty. And then my rated door did that not stick? My fire rating should be one. OK. And then this door here, if I go to edit type, this also, oh, I think that there's, yeah, this is my non-rated, this is a rated. If I change this back to non-rated, then this will not have a fire rating. So the reason that I'm doing this is because I can now visualize what's rated and what's not by going into the filter. So we have a view template currently set up. So for my working view here, I'm going to again remove the view template. And I'm going to go into my visibility graphics VB, go into filters. I'm going to create a new filter by clicking edit new. Click here. And I'm going to call this fire rating. And I'm going to define the rules. I'm going to go to doors here. And I'm going to go to doors fire rating is greater than zero. Oops, let me go back. Yeah, this is all OK. I hit enter. I meant to kind of just escape that, but this is all good. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to add a fire. Add, then I have to add the filter to the view. So I first created my view, then I have to add it. So I'm going to click on fire rating, click OK, and I'm going to have my cut lines be override by, let's just make it red for now. Well, actually, the furniture is red, so for the sake of clarity, we'll just make it green. Click OK, click OK. So if I click OK, you'll see that my rated door now has a filter on it. And if I change this to a rated door over here, that will also turn green. So what this is helpful for is if I have a really big floor plan and I want to see which doors are rated and which ones aren't, I can do it this way without having to click on each individual door. It's a way for me to just quickly and easily globally visualize all of the different uh, ratings and, and things for, for the thing, for the, for the plan without going through item by item. So this is, you know, this is really, really helpful. Filters are an awesome way to be able to QA, QC things. Sometimes you might use it um, to sh only show certain things for printing or not printing or in the documentation view. But more often than not, I use it for um, I use it for checking to make sure things are categorized and uh, scheduled properly, or not scheduled properly, but have the proper parameters associated with them. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start setting up some 3D views. And if I come here, I have my 3D view. And let's say I want this to be kind of like a little bit of a presentation view. I can duplicate this. And I'm going to call it presentation, 3D presentation. And then I want to do things like turn off the levels. Let's say I don't want those. Click OK. So now I've got my, my presentation view. I can do things like turn on the shadow if I want to. Whatever I want to do in order to get this to be visually what I, what I desire it to be. Now the problem right now is that if I rotate this, it's not really like a fixed view. But what I can do actually is lock this. So I'm going to lock this view and save orientation and lock view. And then what it does is it creates a 3D view for me that I can then crop it, show the crop region, make this an actual, an actual view. And I can start to do things like add annotations to this. So I can come in here. I might even be able to tag things. Yeah, so you can actually tag things in here. 
So like I could tag this furniture in this 3D view now by clicking on the tag here. And like I could add, uh, I thought I had enough furniture tag loaded. Yes. I don't know what happened to our furniture tag. Did we, let's, oh, I think I maybe didn't check it properly. So let's go back into insert, load Autodesk family, uh, annotations, um, clear this, architectural, furniture tag, load, and now I can tag, I can actually tag, maybe I'll use a leader here. But it's cool because you can, you know, actually, let's call this F1 for furniture one. That might actually be a type based thing. So come into type, type mark, F1, click OK. So it's cool because you can actually start annotating 3D views. I'm going to turn this off for now. And you know what? I'm going to go back into my my object styles and make my furniture not red because it's a little bit distracting. So I can start to then um, tag all this furniture with these leaders. So it's pretty cool. I don't know if I can dimension. Can I dimension? Yeah, I can dimension in 3D, which is exciting. So there's lots of cool things that you can start to do. You can add text in 3D. And this will now be a 3D presentation view. Um, if I wanted to do a cutaway, I could also do that. So maybe I go back to this view and I'm gonna turn off my levels again. And I can come in and um, I can come in and I can go to um, annotation. No, I'm sorry. Uh, scope box. Oh no, section box. I'm sorry. Put on a section box, and then I can start to drag this. So I could do like a cutaway view of the project through the pool, maybe. And I could make this its own its own view lock this and I'm gonna call this um, cutaway and you know maybe I even pull this in and let's say we wanted to focus just on like a certain condition and do it as like a little bit of a larger scale view I could make this a half inch equals a foot. And then I could start to then, you know, like as we've been doing tag walls and things like that in the view. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, it's pretty robust in how you can start to create like informational 3D views. Now I can't rotate this anymore. If I try to rotate it by holding down shift, I'll get this, this, um, issue here um, but you know for now um, so but 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 that's that's good with the locking right we can lock it this is a view that's saved we name it we can put it on a sheet we can annotate it and we can play with filters we can play with other things in order to get it looking looking pretty nice um, okay so we've got 3d view set up we've got 2d view set up um, one thing I, I um, the last thing I want to show you is how to set up title blocks and things like that. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to go into view and then title block or sheet. I'm going to create a new sheet, which I think we did last time. We created a blank title block. I want to have a 24 by 36 title block in here. So I'm going to go in and see if um, Revit has a good one I can use. Now, um, in general, their title blocks kind of stink, but it's good to start with their title block because it'll have a lot of the preset um, 
a lot of the preset things like uh, like labels and all of that stuff set up already. So I like to start with this and then kind of edit it. But I'm going to click here. I'll load in this 24 by 36 horizontal or 20, sorry, 22 by 34. I'll go to architecture. Sorry, go to view sheet. I'm going to pull up that and it's this generic, you know, Autodesk, etc. title block. I want to, you know, I can start to drop views on this. So like I could drop that cutaway axon on here. Might be too big scale. But here, let's put on this axon a metric. Or no, sorry, 3D presentation view. We'll put this here. So I can start to put those views on the sheet. But um, when I'm then, you know, again, this, this isn't, doesn't look great. So let's customize this a little bit. I'm going to double click on here and baked in it has text right so if I click on this this is text it means it's just something that I can come here and edit but then these things are labels and I want to keep labels the reason I want to keep labels is see how it says client name there let me uh, close out of this for a second There's things that if I come into um, project information here, I can actually edit things like the uh, client name here. Click OK, and it'll update on the sheet. So that's the difference between a label and text. Labels are tied into parameters, text isn't. So if I double click on this, I want to keep things like the labels, but I might want to play with the organization a little bit. So like if I edit this label, you'll see this is the sheet number. If I edit this, this is the sheet name. So I'll let you kind of customize this a bit, but you can add your own symbol here by going to manage images. You can reload it. You can go into insert. And insert an image or import an image. You can change the font type by going into edit type and saying, you know, if we want to stick with our Roboto theme, I can click on my Roboto there and click OK, and it'll edit all of this. I can draw and edit lines. I can make this a wide line if I wanted to. If I didn't want this in here, I could delete this. So you can go in and really, really edit this title block as wanted. Now the thing to be careful and the reason that I like their labels is I like the fact that this label for the drawing sheet is set up already but I don't but I don't like the text or I don't like the font let's say. So I can come into this label go into edit type change this to Roboto and maybe I actually want this to be bold or something so I'll click bold and I'll click apply and then there we go. So once I'll let you take a stab at customizing this and making this look fancier, but once I like the way it looks, I can load it to the project and close. Again, I, I would probably save it somewhere, but if I override the existing version, you'll see some of these changes like this is a different font and so on. Um, the last thing I'll do is in my, um, in my uh, sketch here, I'm going to right click and I'm going to rename this and I'm going to call this, let's say like A-100, or no, let's call this T-100, call it title sheet. And you guys can come up with a much nicer title sheet than I did. Um, but then I could add some text to this title sheet if I wanted to up here and call it like Barcelona Pavilion. I want to make this much bigger. So like even if we change this to quarter inch aerial, it's still maybe too small for a title. So I might edit type, duplicate, and let's call it like half inch Roboto. Change the text font to Roboto. And then um, change the text size to half inch 
click OK, and call it a day. All right, I think that's it for views. We'll uh, come back with more stuff in the next session.